It's ad break time. The Beyond Solitaire podcast is proudly sponsored by Central Michigan University's Center for Learning Through Games and Simulations, and they have some great stuff coming up. Fans of 1,000-Year-Old Vampire will be delighted to know that their next Kickstarter project is Jason Cox's 500-Year-Old Vampire, a new project created with Tim Hutchings' blessing and designed to be a cooperative writing experience that you can try with your friends at home, but that's also written to meet national classroom standards. Jason is my guest for this episode, so you can hear more from him shortly. I'll also be teaching a class for CMU's Certificate in Applied Game Design, so if you ever wanted to take a class with me, here is your chance. The course is called Using Games to Teach What You Can Convey Through Play. It starts March 6th, and registration is open right now. Lastly, I'm going to throw in an ad for myself. If you want to show some love for my show and for my upcoming public scholarship projects, I'd be deeply grateful for your support on Patreon. My goal is to get to a point where I can spend my summers doing board game work instead of teaching summer school, and you'd be helping me to make that happen. For now, though, let's get on with the show. Hey, gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I'm here in the pod with a very special guest, Dr. Jason Cox. Uh, He is the head of the art education program at the University of Toledo, and he's also designer of 500-Year-Old Vampire, a game coming up from Central Michigan University Press I'm super excited about. How are you doing, Jason? I am doing amazingly. (laughs) So before we get into your game, tell us about art education. (laughs) Right. So uh, I I am the head of the art education program, and a lot of people aren't real clear about what that means. It literally means I teach art teachers. Uh, it's a K through 12 program. Uh, it covers rural, suburban, and urban environments. And there's a, a lot of different ways of dealing with it, but a lot of it these days tends to be about the making of meaning. Uh, there's a, a professor that I once had whose name was Dr. Patty Bodie, and one of her big claims was that art is not a privilege, it's a human right. And that's a, uh, a kind of central to my practice of art education um, in terms of it being something that engages with us on a, uh, a very human important level that is essential to who we are. I, uh, so I will confess, I'm currently working as a high school teacher, but I never took an education class. I got alternatively certified by teaching in a district for three years. And like, I think I turned out okay, but, um, you know, what are we missing when we don't go to, go to an education (laughs) program? (laughs) Well, I think I shocked a, a colleague of mine recently when I said, technically there isn't a discipline that you need to go to a college to learn. The difference is, uh, one, the speed at which you learn, but also the social environment. When you're part of a class, when you have the give and take, when you have the critiques, when you have people introducing new ideas or challenging ideas, the the way you develop is different. The the contacts you talk to are different. What you're exposed to will be different. Um, The techniques matter, don't get me wrong. I mean, it's if you're a self-taught sculptor who's used to working with a chainsaw, the first time somebody introduces you, introduces you to a Dremel tool, you're like, what? Uh, <laughs> it's and it's the same thing. You can be uh, uh, you can be a terrific teacher without taking an education course, but there are things the education courses might supply you with um, philosophies, pedagogies. You never really know what's going to click. Um, there's a teacher whose name is Graham Sullivan. He's out of University of Pennsylvania. One of the things, uh, or rather Pennsylvania State University, my fault. One of the things he says is that as context change, meanings change. And there's a, a mistaken belief by a lot of people that, that education is the same regardless of context. And that is, uh, for anyone who's ever been a teacher, it's poppycock. Um, so, so having the experience of going through a program can sometimes teach you the adaptability to adjust to those different environments. Uh, so you do art education, but yep. what I'm here to talk to you about is a game that you designed according to high school ELA standards. And that'd be 500 year old vampire. Is that correct? It is. Although it actually includes the, the art standards as well. Um, 
it has English and art standards uh, included in the in the curriculum that I was keeping in mind, uh, but not history. Uh, there are reasons for that that we can go into if you like. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I kind of do actually. But uh, first, uh, how did you uh, how did you decide to design this game? Like, what was the process to from sure. like you know? Oh, like did you play Thousand Year Old Vampire first? You know, did you want to design a classroom I game? I did. <laughs> uh, so a little bit more about my background. Um, so my my PhD for my work, I used uh, live action role play, specifically American freeform role play as a arts based research method. Uh, and that is probably a whole different episode. Um, so that's when I first started really writing games and thinking about their intersection with education, especially art education. Um, and some of my thinking for that actually still comes through in 500 year old vampire. Uh, and I've written other educational games since then. One of them was called Mantles in the Museum, which I co-wrote with Dr. Lillian Lewis. Uh, and it was designed to be played in a museum where people take on the roles of different um, stakeholders uh, who are deciding what works from the museum ought to be sent off to this big international show. And it does a couple things. For one thing, it teaches you different um, philosophies that might come to, to play, like what what is good in art isn't necessarily uh, written in stone. And so it kind of approaches that through different critical frameworks. But it also actually does a thing where it questions the power of the museum to tell you what is and is not good or art or what have you. Uh, it is, is a subtle subterfuge. So <laughs> I was presenting this uh, at Metatopia and Tim Hutchings, who wrote Thousand Year Old Vampire, uh, played it and he has a background in art and we had uh, a lot of great uh, discussion at that time. Uh, about a, a number of different things. And that was, I think it was before Thousand Year Old Vampire had come out. Uh, but it was, it was a pretty tremendous success, uh, as you might know. And people began approaching him about the idea of doing an educational version. And he felt that it wasn't something he was very comfortable doing. Uh, because it wasn't how he wrote it, it wasn't his speciality. And he approached me about the idea. And so I began working on it at that point. And uh, a little bit later than that, I, 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 maybe half a year or so, uh, Central Michigan University Press had begun to, to talk to Tim about it, and Tim connected them with me. Uh, and it's kind of grown from there. Oh, that's really exciting, honestly. Um, so how do you, I, one of the questions I always ask myself as somebody who likes to bring games to my classroom, right, is, um, you know, kids can smell an educational game from a mile away. Um, you know, nobody wants to do like the math roll and move or whatever, which this certainly is not. But how do you balance between the fun factor and making sure that you are meeting educational standards? Because I feel like that's always a challenge. It, it is a challenge. I mean, there's, um, I, have, I don't want to keep name dropping, but I'm going to name drop. My friend Sharong Biswas and I were talking, uh, one of the things about the term educational games is that there isn't really a lot of oversight of it, um, of what that means, of what counts, of what it requires. So you'll find a number of educational games that are either not particularly good games or are not particularly educational. Um, often because the people in charge of them assume that the requisite skills are ones they already have. Uh, everyone, everyone can be educational. After all, we all went to school or, you know, games are simple. Everyone plays games. That kind of thinking. Uh, and it tends to, to, to shoot you in the foot. Um, to balance uh, what I would call the, the intrinsic appeal of games, of playing because you want to play, with the kind of extrinsic uh, products, a, a grade, commentary, progress, what have you, 
is a challenging thing. Um, there's a number of different authors who, who kind of approached it. Um, and in a school context, one of the things that's especially challenging is that for a game to feel like a game, you have to have the option of not playing it. And that's challenging in a school. And another thing is that you have to accept that not every game is perfect for every person. Uh, my games in particular tend to want a little bit more role playing. And for, I don't know, eight out of 10, nine out of 10 students, that's an exciting opportunity. But for people with high degrees of anxiety, not always so much. Um, normally having the option to bow out, the option to do something alternative can help give enough safety for them to still play, but not always. Uh, so it can be a challenge. The best thing to do just going into it is to be upfront about these and not authoritarian, um, to do what you can to provide enough comfort and safety for the players to engage with the rule set. And frankly, that's the same thing I would say if I were talking to one of my students about teaching. Uh, I don't honestly see a lot of difference between game design and unit plan design. Because one way or the other, if you want to have growth, then you need to have both challenge and safety. Uh, and there's always going to be a tension between those things. Um, what you want to avoid is chores. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and I think all too many of us can remember schooling that felt like a chore. Or oh, yeah. the, the odd game that did too. <laughs> all right. So just um, to kind of take a step back. What exactly is 500 year old vampire for people who have never heard about it, who are hearing this podcast for the first time? Like what, what are these kids going to be doing? Oh man, I should have had the, the blurb up in front of me. Um, so 500 year old vampire is a, a variation. It was inspired by and takes some of its mechanics from thousand year old vampire. Uh, but it follows the course of uh, a group of vampires. Uh, over a span of centuries. Uh, it won't necessarily go all the way to 500. Uh, it will tend to be no less than 300 and no more than, oh, I suppose if you rolled high, you might get up to 600, but it's unlikely. Um, so somewhere in that range. And the, the people who are playing uh, document this journey through a series of letters that they send to the other members of their cohort, the other vampires, and through artifacts that they make. Um, you don't have to be a great artist to make something, but you do have to make something visual within the, within the game, which is the, the thing that gives a lot of people anxiety. Uh, and through the course of the game, you'll see the vampires first enter into their undead existence uh, grow in power, probably lose their humanity, and eventually uh, whatever end is going to come to them. Often a fairly sticky one, but they are inhuman monsters. And there we go. <laughs> so I, um, I play tested this and had a really good time. And I also actually got a oh, lot good. of personal satisfaction out of Thousand Year Old Vampire, like the individual version. But for people who um, don't necessarily imagine an English and art class as a writing exercise about the lives of vampires, uh, how, how, I mean, I feel this has meaning, right? But I'm asking for the person who doesn't necessarily see it. Like, why is this a worthwhile thing to be doing with students? And what is it designed to elicit from them that, that makes this worth the class time? Well, there's a couple of different things. Uh, for one thing, there's like I just was mentioning the extrinsic and intrinsic value. It's, it is inherently cool to make <laughs> something that covers the uh, kind of supernatural existence. It's got a, a lot of creativity that's involved with it. Um, the, the quote I gave you from Graham Sullivan before is important because one of the things that the game does is it contextualizes things. Uh, having some idea of who you're writing to makes a difference in terms of your writing. If you've ever tried to write to nobody, you will discover that your writing is probably not its best. 
uh, and having some frame of reference for things you're trying to make can get away from what we sometimes call the terror of the blank canvas. Uh, and the other effect of it, because unlike in Thousand Year Old Vampire, which is kind of a solo journaling thing, the cohort here serves several different purposes. They, they have a narrative purpose. Uh, the only creatures who remember you from back in the day, the only ones who can possibly understand the changes that you've been through, uh, the horrors that haunt you every moment. But at the same time, the players provide a peer group that can give you uh, feedback that are able to see the journey the way that you see it as the vampire moves through the years and encounter different challenges, ideas, experiences. Um, it also does a little bit of challenging of assumptions. So one of the, the things I, uh, I realized early on is that there were some baked in assumptions uh, for one thing, I am I am in my mid forties. Uh, when I was in high school, I played a whole lot of Vampire the Masquerade, and I saw all the the Bram Stoker's Dracula and Interview with the Vampire and all that stuff. And I'm like, to me, that is vampires. Uh, I am not particularly fond of Twilight, but my own <laughs> assumptions, biases, and cultural references shouldn't limit what the players of this game are able to do. And I have to, first of all, confront that. Second of all, if you just play vampires using the references from my own uh, youth and my own assumptions, you end up with literally a bunch of dead white guys. Uh, and that was a problem to me early on. So part of the design of it was to encourage people to move around you know, onto different continents and to explore the the arts and histories uh, at least in a very surface level way uh, of, of different places and times and a lot of what happens when you go in is you i don't know anything about the ottoman empire of 1700 what's it look like at that time uh and it there's there's not an infinite amount of information online, the way people sometimes think, but there's enough of it for us to go there and begin to be interested in, in things that, that trouble those assumptions. Um, so the game does a little bit of that as well, uh, of pushing back on, on kind of the, the things that we just assumed were in place. Um, that is actually one of the reasons it's 500 year old vampire. Because the very first time I play tested it, uh, I said, what continent would you like to be from? And they chose Australia. Uh, and I discovered that in terms of written history, if you're looking at Australia, you will not find very much before 1600 because the British were very effective at destroying it. Sometimes you'll find oral history, but the other thing that you'll encounter at that point is that culturally speaking, uh, the indigenous people of Australia didn't, they don't keep time the same way the Europeans did. So trying to make it fit within the context of the game uh, is very, very difficult. So I shortened the time span to 500 in part to make sure that uh, history was broadly more accessible uh, and that we didn't spend all of our time in freaking Europe. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough, indeed. So um, this all sounds really interesting. You are, you know, allowing students to play across the course of history. They can bring their own backgrounds and interests to this game. You know, they are able to engage their creativity. So I guess my next question is, uh, how are you imagining this game actually playing out in class? Because one of the things I wondered about is, okay, is this something that you do once a week? Is it like a whole unit? Um, can teachers do it any way they want? And you've written in options. How, uh, how do you actually envision this game being played in a, in a real classroom? Sure. Uh, so I should say, first of all, that the game as written can be played by a group of friends. You can really go anywhere between three to six people on the small scale. Uh, and then there's a, uh, a slightly larger, more complex version that you end up with in the classes. 
Uh, there, it is actually designed to be a little bit adaptable to the needs of the class. I have some pre-generated characters that I offer up as choices as well, which have uh, some of the a lot of the things filled in if you need to get right into it, or if you have students who are don't want to engage with the character generation part. Um, early on, that was one of the problems I had is character generation just it took too long, uh, and there were too many options. So uh, narrowing it down a bit was was kind of important. Um, but the general idea is that when there is class time, that's when the, the vampires meet in their cohort and they share out the various letters they have sent to each other and the artifacts they have made. Uh, they receive prompts. These are um, a lot like the ones from Thousand Year Old Vampire. A lot of the text I took was from what Tim had originally written. Uh, but I, hmm, how can I put this? I made them more universal. Like I, I broke it down into here's a narrative thing, here's a game effect. Uh, and then on the bottom, how many years are you adding before the, the next time we check in on our, on our uh, undead monstrous beings? Um, and they also do some research. Uh, for the new time period that they're looking at. And the research doesn't have to be in depth. It really should only take, you know, uh, 15 odd minutes. Then while the players are not in class is when they're working on the writing or working on the, uh, the artifacts that they're going to be sharing in the next class. Uh, this does a kind of balancing act between having the spotlight right at the beginning when you go, here are the things I made, and then the group work that follows it. Uh, having that spotlight first tends to be kind of important for establishing the community that you want them to have. And the, the group work is, it's, it's footwork, it's, it's important, uh, you know, it's, uh, but it is not as interesting. It's just the thing that leads to the interesting thing. Uh, another thing that I've been developing is the way that the different cohorts would interact if you have a lot of them. So my, my classes tend to be a little smaller, but if you've got 35 students in a class, uh, then it gets to a point where vampire cohort from Africa is like, what's going on over there with those vampire cohort from South America or, or what have you. Uh, and they want to start to have interactions. And I've been developing uh, some rules for what happens when cohorts meet a kind of grand convocation, if you will. There's a couple other uh, things that I ought to mention also, I suppose. Uh, one, um, in Tim's original game, the the vampire that turns you to a vampire might appear in some of the early prompts, but tends to disappear rather quickly. Uh, it's not that much of an influence on your life past the first couple of prompts. Uh, right. Whereas their existence is a unifying factor for the cohort. It's the same master vampire who has done this to all of them. And it's it's got kind of a long shadow over them. Uh, I also want to say that the, the original Thousand Year Old Vampire, Tim had developed a dice mechanic that uh, for people who were used to playing that kind of game was not very problematic, but I found in introducing it to students, the idea that a die could have more or less than six sides is, is a big idea. Uh, and then adding dice and subtracting dice, it, it added to a complexity to it that was problematic for them. Uh, so what we did was we switched over to a series of decks. So they come in as neophytes. Uh, they, rather, they, they get their origin, and then there's the neophyte, elder, ancient, and then the conclusion deck. Uh, and on the back of these, I don't have you seen the, the card art? I have not. I'm really excited oh, about the card art. I'm not sure I can share that with you. Uh, so, so Jabari, uh, Jabari Weathers has, has done fabulous, uh, art that goes on the back of each card and, uh, it's, I, I'm pleased as punch with it. Uh, so they, they kind of 
represent some of the, the themes and feelings of, of this progress to the vampire's existence. Dude, that's really exciting. So is it meant to be played across four sessions or can you spend extend more or less time <laughs> in each of the decks? Uh, well, it's designed to be played across 10 sessions. Okay. Um, but you can adjust it. When we've played it at conferences, uh, the, the time period is obviously very, very squished. Uh, so you can do a pretty quick advancement of Origin, Neophyte, Elder, and even straight into Conclusion if you wanted to with that, uh, and skip the Ancient entirely. So it's possible to play it in a single session, certainly, and we've done that several times. Uh, you, can, you, could, you could get it down to two hours if you really, really wanted to but it doesn't give you as much ability to engage with the system. Um, right. The general idea is to spread it out over a longer period of time so that it is uh, a, a piece of an ongoing high school or, or uh, early college level course. Uh, and the conclusion of it is something that is the exhibition. So one of the effects of, of doing all this writing and the creating of artifacts is that you generate a lot of tangible physical media uh, that can be shared. And at my university, the, the school library uh, is kind enough to let me to put things up on top of all the bookshelves. And we kind of set that up as our uh, exhibition, the idea being that in the contemporary day, some archaeologists is like, ah, oh, this is clearly all myth and folklore, but here are the artifacts. And then you put them up on display with some information in the letters that go along with them. And oh, that's cool. uh, yeah, it's it seeing it all together is a very different experience. Um, though I would say it's a thing where like if you see it all together, it's a powerful experience. But the most powerful experience that I feel for, for anyone who's ever engaged with it is both the, the emergent experience of seeing how it goes, the directions it goes, the choices people make for media and things they want to convey and how they want to write. And then at the end, having it all collected together uh, feels fundamentally different. Uh, it's a you had to be there kind of thing. That's fantastic. And so this is so experiential. It sounds like something that would be really, really memorable for a student. And I think that's super exciting. What, how do you grade it though? Like that's <laughs> one of the, <laughs> I, I struggle with that. Well, like basic stuff. <laughs> there, the, there are rubrics that are attached to it um, in terms of, of how well you're representing different things. So the, the written part of it specifically you have to do something that's establishing a context for understanding where are you when are you why are you you know the uh what makes this meaningful so the prompts give you some starting points uh, aside from the narratives i actually put also some critical questions on every prompt that are if you just answered them as if it was a question and answer thing to on a Google form, you would have very, very boring writing. But, but if you instead kind of engage with it as a, a broader question, uh, it tends to be much more productive. And it gives you the opportunity to, to fill things out. Uh, ideally, in a way that the, the rubric certainly establishes the expectations. But if you engage with the game as written, the rubric is almost um, besides the point in terms of your experience. You don't really care about that extrinsic thing as much because the intrinsic appeal uh, should already be pushing you towards that outcome. The thing that people tend to get a little bit nervous about is the artistic element more than the written, especially if they're, if they're experienced game players or especially experienced role players, they're, they're fairly comfortable with writing and acting. Uh, but the amount of time someone has, has informed me that they can't even draw a straight line. Like that is, I hear that multiple times in multiple classes and just constantly. Uh, 
and there's a lot of anxiety people have about the things that they make. And when they make them in playtests, sometimes they say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I told you I'm not good at And I'm like, you're really not. You're missing the point. <laughs> um, <laughs> because the I'm not trying to get people to be master draftsmen or, or ceramicists that whose work will be remembered for ages. I'm trying to get them to engage in a kind of uh, meaningful visual language to use the ability to to create and handle things uh, differently and right. to experiment. And a big part of what I'm looking for in terms of the of the art rubrics is that experimental angle. Uh, and a lot of the work that I've seen that has been most interesting has been things that weren't actually made uh, out of traditional artistic materials. So one person had tried to make themselves a teapot, like a paper mache teapot, and it, it utterly did not work. <laughs> they were unhappy with it. <laughs> so instead, what they did was they opened up a bunch of tea bags and pushed those tea leaves into the shape of a teapot uh, and took a picture of that instead. Okay. Uh, which uh, I just, I was blown away by that. Um, people have decorated dolls. People have, people have taken photos of themselves wearing Oculus Rift headgear. Uh, that, that was the end of one particular vampire who was stuck in the metaverse forever after. Like he was uploaded to Facebook <laughs> and couldn't get out. Uh, <laughs> and I've had collages and pop-up books and uh there was one vampire who had the memory of their mother erased from their mind and so they carefully drew a charcoal portrait and then hit it hard with an eraser uh and it, I, it darn near broke my heart looking at that that picture um Aww. well it's, you know there's a, there's yeah. a lot there um but if you see that picture without context without without knowing the vampire story, uh, without knowing why it would matter that here's this picture of a woman, but it appears to have been erased, and then it doesn't, it doesn't hit the same way. And so right. the experimentation tends to be really valuable. Um, my students uh, are, are generally speaking fairly confident in at least one art media, but uh, in, in the playtests, I've seen a lot come out of people building sculptures out of paper or twist ties or pipe cleaners. Um, without context, maybe they're not that important. With context, with context, it kind of feels like they deserve to be in a case. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing what's important. Like, you know, I have a background in classics and, you know, one of my favorite papyri is literally one that got used as toilet paper that we just <laughs> still have. <laughs> You know, I mean, truly one person's trash is another's treasure, right? But like, it's that context that, that brings so much value. So yeah. it sounds like your playtests have produced really amazing results for, especially for students who've really embraced the process. What do you do about the students who are more recalcitrant? I don't want to play a game in class. I don't want to be here. I don't know if I want to do this. Like, you know, I mean, nothing can, nothing is foolproof with that. But um, sure. what are some ways that you've seen people get drawn into this game in particular? Well, one thing that matters is seeing other people having fun, to be honest. It's one of the reasons that it works better as a cohort than as an individual thing. Um, on your own, uh, the idea of lonely fun, I'm, I'm there for it. But for people who are not familiar with it, um, who, who don't engage that way, it's, it's a thing that will push them away. Um, not everyone is, 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 is a choose your own adventure kind of person. Um, so being part of a community that's doing it makes a big difference. Um, the way that the characters are related to each other, like this is a thing that uh, has been built up over various iterations of, of the game is that the characters do know each other, that they have a relationship to each other, that they might right. want to monkey with each other. Uh, so, 
So that makes a difference. Um, but also having the option to opt out is a thing. Uh, so if a student really wants to opt out of presenting, if they don't feel like reading a letter to everyone else, um, there's not really a, a reason that they would have to. They still have to do the writing and the art because those are the assignments. But if they don't want to engage with the more the overt role-playing aspects, they could pass it off to another player and let them do the reading. Uh, it's easy enough to come up with diegetic reasons for a vampire to not want to speak or to not even be present when the rest of the cohort meets or to be present but stay up in the rafters disguised as a bat. You know, it's <laughs> it, it's it's not that hard to to make the adjustments in order for them to feel like they can participate. Um, right. The other thing that I ran into early on that's a slightly different uh, question. When I started working on this game, it was the middle of the pandemic uh, at its worst. And so we were playing online. Uh, and one thing about that is that uh, my, my early playtests, especially, I kept everything in Google Sheets. So you could upload your images direct into there rather than having them in, the, in a physical presence. So it's still something that can be engaged with virtually. Uh, that is actually one of the other things I should mention. One of the other things we've talked about is, is the idea of playing with cohorts across different schools. Uh, and, and that's something I'm kind of excited to see, but we haven't really experimented too much with yet. Uh, but it's it's certainly possible because, like I said, in the early days, we we just played online and we uploaded the the imagery and the words there. Um, and it's a slightly different experience. I do. Yeah, I do enjoy the tactile experience of someone made like a wand and the the the, uh, the feeling of the weight of it in your hand uh, was 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 pretty great. But there's all kinds of ways that. Uh, accommodations and adaptability can come into play. Yeah. I mean, the historian in me, even though I know this is not history standards, which I do want to talk about, uh, I can see doing something like giving other cohorts the packet of artifacts and letters and asking them to make sense of it. Like, oh, we found this time capsule, you know, reconstruct the tale of the vampires, you know, and just kind of see what they came up with. Um, you could, you know, push it forever, really. But, uh, you know, we talk about this game being written to standards because this sounds so good. Um, and it also is, you know, classroom ready. Which standards did you choose? Like, I know that each state has like slight variations. And, you know, what did uh, you what did you end up picking to give it the most mileage? Well, that is a, a good question. Uh, I, in fact, use national standards. Um, so most of the time, a state will write their individual standards with feedback from various organizations um, that establish them in, in, in a national sense. Those are, they're not universally applied, uh, but there are some amount of overlap. And if you were to go to most museum websites, you will find that, that often they have unit plans there for engaging with their collection. They do the same thing. Uh, they use They use national standards because Let's say you're at the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is a very, very constrained school district. <laughs> so if you want anyone not Washington, D.C. to look at it, you have to write them a little bit more general. Uh, to be honest, I would have to go back and, and look up the, the specific standards that I laid out in my document, which I can certainly do while I'm talking. Uh, but I... I think one thing I'm going to ask, uh, if you have a guess about why I did not use the history standards. <laughs> well, I think because it's partially time, like, you know, the, the history research versus the creative exercise, it seems to me like they would butt heads. If you want students to be able to just look up something quick and get moving, that's a different kind of project than did you properly situate your vampire in their historical context without flaw and know the major movements of the time. And, you know, it just seems like that wouldn't necessarily lead to anything good. That is a big part of it. Um, <laughs> in order to do the history justice, uh, you can't do just Google. Um, right. It, so it tends to be much more narrowly focused. 
The other thing is um, kind of what you were just pointing at. The different states engage with history very differently, uh, what they decide to prioritize, but it tends again to be pretty narrowly focused. And one of the things I mentioned early on was I wanted this game to to span the world. Um, and my experience was that the history standards I was encountering at a high school level were not built in a way that was going to engage with the, the uh, pedagogy and, uh, and epistemology that kind of underlines um, the way I was putting things together. Like it, it just wasn't practical. Uh, so that's why. <laughs> uh, all right, so I have the standards in front of me here. Um, the, the broad headings that I had over for writing Common Core standards were about text types and purposes, production and distribution of writing, and research to build and present knowledge. Uh, the visual art standards, most things break down into creating, responding, connecting. Sometimes there's social and emotional learning, depending on the state that you're in. And a lot of it has to do with how you're experimenting, uh, looking for how to express a theme, how different artists have worked with a theme, and how to situate things culturally. Uh, the, the writing stuff, just to back up to a bit, has a lot to do with being clear uh, and in developing narratives that are informative in terms of, of everything it needs to contain, but also emotive uh, and kind of balancing those two things out. So it's, they're pretty broad strokes uh, over top of it. And then the rubrics, I'm, let's see, you came from not education. So uh, I, I tend to try to keep my rubrics uh, at no more than five different categories. Uh, mm -hmm. I use yeah, small is good. For, yeah, <laughs> for people who are not used to education in general, there's a lot of different ways. Rubrics are not, in fact, the only way to do education, but it's the way I normally do. So it's a grid that lays out uh, different things that you're trying to assess, and then a number scale or a percentage or, or what have you. Um, typically, using either three or five columns. Uh, the reason that there are rarely the one thing that you run into is that most people are like, well, they should all get a B plus. That is column four. Uh, so <laughs> you have to actually be pretty clear about what exactly you're looking for within the rubric. Um, I am, I personally am always kind of amazed. I feel like I design uh, projects that should make it real easy to get an A. So, so if you if you have the expectations laid out, the students are able to to play to it. Um, but if the students don't find work meaningful, then that's when they tend to slide sideways on that rubric for you. Uh, and yeah. hopefully, a game like Five Hundred Year Old Vampire helps helps keep you more on the the positive side of that equation. Indeed. Indeed. And, you know, just one other classroom question. This is on my mind a lot, especially as, you know, uh, in a world of contentious board meetings and discussions about what should be allowed in the school libraries and all of that. What kinds of considerations went into the design of this game to make it as, I guess, palatable as possible for as many different environments as possible? Like vampires sounds a little edgy, but my experience of this game were like very classroom safe. So what kinds of thought like went into that? <laughs> well, the, the classroom safe part of it is, has been a, a consideration, especially at a high school level. Um, so there's a couple of different things. Um, one, I did alter some of the text uh, that was in the original prompts. And there's some that I just decided I, would, I did not choose to include. Uh, references to slavery in particular. Uh, either being done by the character or to the character or things that I just chose to remove. Um, there, there's such a thing as loyalty. There's people that work for you, but there is not generally speaking um, some kind of bonded slavery. Uh, and some of the more, I would say 1970s hammer film style descriptions uh, in the in the prompts 
were ones that I altered a little bit uh, to make them easier for people to engage with. Uh, it has also been a question in terms of the artwork that we asked Jabari to produce and how uh, we engaged with what they gave us. And the other things that I would say, there are some things where I do have to uh, stand by principles. Um, for instance, I chose to include pronouns for both the players and, and the vampires. Uh, I think it matters. I think it's important. There's a lot of people I care about who do not use the the pronouns that were more common when I grew up. And there we go. Uh, so, <laughs> and that has been, you know, the, the language has changed throughout the history, but there's always been people who do not fit those binaries. And uh, I do not care to pretend otherwise. So that's a part of the game. Um, I do have safety mechanics that are in the rules. Uh, I don't know how much your listeners have engaged with them before. I include uh, specifically one, clear expectations, just in terms of that's what I would tell the teacher, two, right. lines and veils, which is being upfront if there's something that you just don't want to include at all, or if you if someone else is going to include it, uh, they, they have to ask first. Uh, for instance, uh, being the parent of a very young child, things involving children, I can be pretty squeamish about. And that's something that I would just automatically say, I, I, I don't care to see that in this game. Uh, another thing that is in my safety rules is the X card developed by John Stavropoulos. Uh, it's, it's pretty well known as a immediate things are not safe and I need us to not do this uh, situation. And worst comes to worst, you always have to give people the option of the open door. Um, the, that is a, that's a tough one to learn. Um, and in my mind, in my mind, the safety tools are some of the important things for specifically the high school students, but also the college students, heck, even adults, to learn to deal with, to learn right. to hold other people's uh, safety in mind is part of building a community. And the theme of community, even a, a twisted and evil community, such as the cohort of vampires, uh, does run through the game. And to, to engage with it properly is to be aware of other people. Uh, yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. So um, before I kind of move into the, the softball end of interview questions, I had one more, which is, so for teachers who have never done anything like this in class before, they don't game with their students, they've never role played with their students. How simplified is the startup for this game? Like how, how would you, how, how easily would you say is possible for somebody to go from zero to this in their classroom? Uh, I, well, like I said, I think most game design and unit plan design, they, they're, they're, they're pretty close friends. Um, one of the things I ran into early on, a lot of my players were not were students who had not really played very many games, honestly. Uh, so I had to keep on developing tables and charts that, that uh, simplified things. And if they made things less simple, then I had to go back and get rid of them, start over again. Uh, so I laid out um, pretty early on, here is the sequence of play. Uh, here is the first session, here are the following sessions. And the curriculum guide in particular has some time suggestions for how long people ought to be doing things. Uh, I originally had those in the basic rules as well, but they make more sense if oriented specifically to a classroom. Uh, the other thing that makes things a lot more accessible, like I said, are the pre-generated characters. Um, part of the reason for that is, is one of the initial holdups on people tends to be the research portion. They're not sure what they should or should not research. Uh, also vampires in my game, they, they all drink blood. Uh, they're all afraid of the sun <laughs> and they all live a real long, long, long time. 
but they aren't necessarily <laughs> the uh, the Dracula type vampire that we with that we think of. So in the pre-generated characters, what I did was I found characters, uh, myths, folklore that fit kind of within those bounds of rules, and I use them as vampire analogs. They are technically vampires sometimes. Um, there isn't really a vampire analog in Australia. There are things that will feel, feed on your life force and that only come out at night. Uh, but the, the pre-gen characters give you uh, the context for understanding things. They give you some vampire lore for you to investigate and build on. Uh, and they give you a set of relationships for understanding where people are coming from and who they are. Uh, even within that, people are free to make adjustments. So one time I play tested this, and like I said, uh, there's all of my pregens include a couple. Uh, I, I, I generally use he, him, she, her, or they, them pronouns on those characters. I do not mind if someone changes to something else, like Zizer, or if they want to change what I have down for the character. Um, I did some research for, for naming conventions, and I used uh, gender non-specific names on several of the characters. So when I've play tested it, there have been people who just firmly felt that the pronouns I had down were not the ones that they cared to have. Uh, and they, they have that right. It's their character. Uh, but it gives them a good starting place. So even a uh, it's a long way around to answer your question. Um, I think the pregens and the the things that articulate the different steps of play make it pretty accessible. Uh, I also have been working on a couple of narrative sections that just it's it's fluff that that helps kind of establish what it might look like. Uh, and yeah, it's exciting stuff for me. It's exciting for me too. Uh, but for now, um, what are you playing right now for fun? Oh my goodness. Uh, I have been playtesting a friend's game, uh, which has been a lot of fun for me. And I am not sure how much I should talk about it because it's playtest. Uh, and then, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's um, uh, broadly speaking, it's a super villain game. Uh, but it's, it's actually more about the relationship those super villains have with their families than about the super villainy. That's just their day job. Uh, it's like season two of the wire and the other game that I just finished before that was the fantasy flight version of star Wars. Uh, not honestly my favorite system, uh, cause I hate <laughs> those dice. There's too many times when they give me 1000 advantages and no successes. Uh, <laughs> but, but I love the people and playing with the people is what, makes uh makes it fun uh yeah nice and then if people have questions for you or they want to follow your work where can you be found online oh <laughs> uh well uh one thing I, I i certainly wouldn't mind the odd email uh i will tell you i will actually have to look up my website because i engage with it <laughs> so rarely We'll put it in the that, show notes for everybody out there. Yeah, I will put it in the show notes. Um, yeah, I, I have a professional website as well. Uh, and I could also give you, uh, to, to put in the show notes, I can actually get you the website that has Mantles in the Museum. Uh, it is a free download if people want to play that through Dr. Lewis's website. And uh, I, I would love to hear some feedback. Fantastic. I will do that. Check the show notes, everybody. Um, as for me, uh, you know, if, hopefully, you know, from listening to this podcast, you can find me anywhere online as Beyond Solitaire. Uh, Jason, thank you so much for your time and for talking to us about your game. I think this is super exciting. Thank you very much for having me. And everybody out there, please like, subscribe, comment, ask questions, and most of all, happy gaming. <laughs>